Craig, I'm sorry, it's important we look at the facts. Why? Why? Douglas Ross is sounding pretty scared. I believe in independence. And he clapped like a seal. Hello and welcome to another Planet Hollywood. I'm Paul Hutchin, political editor of The Daily Record. Joining me this week, the final week before recess, to mull over the week's events are Hannah Roger, who's the chief reporter at the Sunday Mail, and we've got also uh, the Scottish Daily Express editor, Ben Borland. Kind of fluffed my lines there a bit. Um, so much of the focus this week has been on Hamza Yusuf's first year anniversary since winning the SNP leadership and becoming first minister. And let's face it, what a year it's been. Um, Operation Branch Form exploding in the lap of the SNP, Nicola Sturgeon's WhatsApp scandal, Michael Matheson resigning as health secretary um, over that debacle with his iPad. I think it'd be fair to say that Hamza has been under the cosh from day one. So, Hannah, just starting with you, is it an exaggeration to say that it's been a year from hell for Hamza? No, it's not an exaggeration at all. I think he's had a terrible year politically, but also, you know, we have to remember that his wife's parents were stuck in Gaza for a, quite a long time. Um, you know, that's obviously caused quite a lot of personal stress. Um, he's expecting a baby um, as well. So there's just been a whole lot of stuff going on for Hamza uh, this year. Um, I think, you know, definitely the biggest sort of problem for him has been the operation branch form, I would say. Um, that doesn't look like it's going away anytime soon, although it's kind of quieting down. But we've also had, you know, I think the difference between the SNP under Nicola Sturgeon and the SNP under Hamza is that they seem less disciplined. Um, but I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. You know, you've got people like Kate Forbes, you've got uh, Fergus Ewing. Um, obviously, you had Ash Reagan, who's now left. Uh, you know, they were kind of quite a, a lot more openly critical of, of certain policies that you would never have seen under Nicola Surgeon. But to be honest, you know, as somebody who kind of frequently goes on about the comparison between Holyrood and Westminster and how in Westminster you get MPs you know, shouting about their own party's policies, whereas in Holyrood you never have it. And I think it's it's quite a healthy thing to, to have. Um, so I'm not necessarily against that, but it's definitely a difference between Hamza and Nicola Sturgeon. Anna, just staying with you for a second. Mm -hmm. See, if you look at his problems of the last 12 months in their totality, I mean, to what extent have they been caused by external factors that you can't control and to what extent have they been caused by his own misjudgments um, and by his own hand? Well, you know, I, I think it's quite easy to separate them out. So obviously branch form, I think everyone or most people would agree, Hamza doesn't, he's not really been able to, that's not something that he's made for himself. You know, he's not created that problem himself. Um, but things like... Uh, what else? Well, Michael Matheson, for example, that is a massive issue that he, I'd say, is, you know, responsible for. Not He's not responsible for Michael Matheson's own behaviour, but he's he mishandled that so poorly. He should have sacked him immediately at the time instead of just letting it linger on. And that has definitely kind of uh, dented his sort of credibility. Um, Remember, he famously said that the matter was closed. Yeah, the case, case was closed. Um, yeah, I think that that was a huge error of judgment. Um, and then, you know, you've just got the sort of perennial issues, which is NHS waiting lists, drug deaths, uh, the ferries, which, you know, are not a unique issue to Hamza Yusuf, but it's fair to say, I think, that he, he's not really made much progress in improving those issues. Um and these are all things that, that you know, if he had made some progress there might have helped his sort of popularity or his credibility, but he's not really addressed them. 
that's that's the sort of key point, isn't it, Ben? You know, he's not responsible for the soaring drug deaths or the housing stats or you know the problems in education. Um, you know, th those were largely caused by the Sturgeon administration, but he could have put the country on a different path um, on these things, and there's little sign that that is the case. Well, well, he, he is responsible. He's the first minister. You know, no, well, is... in terms of historic figures, so a, lot, a lot of the figures that come out... You he, know, he's, of... he's also been a key part of the Sturgeon administration. It's not like he's come in from the cold. He was... You know, he was a senior figure in that administration that's created all these problems. So, so while he may not have been in charge at the time, he's in charge now and he's responsible for all of it. Mm. I, I don't buy this whole, oh, well, these are in problems he's inherited from Nicola Sturgeon. I mean, no, no one gives Rishi Sunak the same, uh, you know, the same free pass and go, oh, well, you know, small boats is a problem he's inherited. If you're if you're in charge of an administration, you're in charge of all of it, and it's all your problem. And 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 he keeps getting a free you know a, a free ride on these things when actually they're all his you know they're all his fault. He's he's in charge, and and, and he's made a mess of his first year. I mean, at, at the risk a, a of a vigorous point, well made. At, at the risk of um, uh, pinching. Uh, Comments made by uh, uh, Bernard Ponsonby, the, 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 the STV political editor who retired down this week. Um, we were highly amused at the Express when he was asked on STV on Tuesday to name some of the, the top political figures of his time. And he pointedly failed to mention anyone from the Sturgeon administration or Humza Yusuf or any of the current crop. I mean, it's a bit like... Uh, it, a sort of Russian doll scenario. The SNP came in, you had Salmond, a real political titan, and all these other weighty figures around him, including Nicola Sturgeon, and she was, you know, she was a fairly talented minister in this field. But then Sturgeon takes over, and suddenly the, the, the talent level drops, and the people she surrounded herself with were, were worse than the predecessors. And then the same things happen. You now... You've taken one figure from the Sturgeon administration, made him first minister. He surrounded himself, and it's it's a kind of uh, the law of diminishing returns. The the, the the talent level in the SNP Green government is is appalling, and you know that's that. I'm sure Bernard Ponsonby would express himself far more eloquently than I would, but it was very very noticeable that he didn't mention anyone from the past ten years. Um, so. No, I, I think you go beyond saying it's been a bad year. It's been a disaster. And it's not just been a disaster for Humza, it's been a disaster for Scotland. And the sooner we can get rid of this failing, abysmal, shocking administration, the better. So, there we go. Um, not mincing the words. The, uh, well, you know, see what you, you think next time. Obviously, the budget was the big opportunity to to set the country in a different path. That, that was the first time that as First Minister, he had this multi-billion pound budget at his fingertips. But by common consent, whether you're on the, the right, whether you're on the left, whether you're in the middle, no one was saying that it was a good budget. It just seems to have been a, a disaster, whatever way you look at politics. Uh, absolutely. If I can, so, sorry to jump in again. I mean, just today we've seen Creative Scotland have had to pull funding from the I Write Festival. Um, so... All these, all, all these small cuts in the budget have knock-on effects. This week, Visit Scotland closed its tourist information centres after a budget cut. Creative Scotland can't fund Glasgow's biggest literary festival after a budget cut. So, so, so the, 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 these budget decisions have real-world implications. And I noticed that Nicola Sturgeon is currently engaged in a bit of a Twitter spat with a reporter from The Scotsman who dared to point out that she oversaw a, a cut to Creative Scotland's budget, um, and, and she's been having a go at him for for just you know reporting facts. But there you go, facts don't seem to matter anymore. Hannah, is there any sort of chink of light at the end of the tunnel for Hamza? Do you see any sort of green shoots of recovery? I mean, oh, I. How do you even answer that? I think if, you know, I think the SNP 
could start to recover when and I don't want it well yeah I, I feel like they could start to recover but they need this branch form thing out of the way mm. um I, I really do think that's a huge kind of factor in this because you know right now it's it's unsettled it's you know still open people are still able to write stories about it you know one way or the other it needs to be come to a conclusion you know whether there's going to be charges brought or the thing is going to be dropped that needs to be done before the party i think can really like rebuild themselves um yeah but in terms do, do, of do you feel hannah that you know this is kind of inevitably all, all these problems that have built up over the years and then sort of accelerated over the last 12 months do you feel like um it's going to end up in a really bad general election result for the SNP? Um, well, the polls are not looking good for the SNP. Um, compare, but then, you know, that's comparing to what we what they've seen in, in the last couple of elections, and they have been incredibly successful. So really, any sort of reduction in that, you know, all their opposition are going to paint it as a, you know, crushing defeat for the SNP but it really does look as if they're not they're not going to be as successful as they have been but it, it's how how many MPs they lose um I think will be very interesting um but I, I can't see them doing I can see them getting more seats than labor and obviously I, I think they'll get them the sort of I'm, I'm careful what I'm saying here. I don't want to say majority or the most, whatever one is. I can't remember, but I think they'll get it's more. It's been both, I think. It's yeah, well. Independent strategy we're talking about. It, yeah, I know. I can't. Basically, I think they'll get more seats, obviously, in the rest of the parties, but it'll be interesting to see by how much. But I don't, I don't see how the electorate, I don't think the electorate are going to completely ignore all the stuff that's going on and certainly the polls are showing that you know the pop their popularity is going down and and votes seem to be transferring to people like labor not so much the tories uh, but then other kind of you know smaller parties as well ben how about you do you think that the SNP are, are headed for a really really bad result or do you think that their core support the independent supporters um, that, that that commands such a sizable bit of the electorate that they could end up winning more seats and actually being able to to say that they've had a, a decent result comparatively uh, by that I mean against the polls unfortunately um, and I say this on a, unfortunately from from my point of view which I think made fairly clear unfortunately I, I don't think they're going to do quite as badly as some of us are hoping um, I think the, the key thing is that, as you say, the polls don't look great, but then there's still, it hasn't really, independence support hasn't really changed. There's still around 45% of the Scottish electorates in favour of independence. If you're in favour of independence, who do you vote for if it's not the SNP at a general election? It does look as though a significant number are gonna, of people, certainly in the central belt, are, are maybe saying, well, look, there's no prospect of a referendum anytime soon. <clears throat> I'd, I'd like to just get rid of the, the Conservative UK government and they're going to vote Labour. But I think enough of that, I think if, if independence support had gone down, back down to where it was for years at, so in the, the, the mid-30s, then you'd be looking at real problems for the SNP. But the fact is that independent support is kind of flatlined and and you know w within that core support there's not really another option other than alba but you know you're not, not going to vote mm. for alba um, and see if you look at uh, um, hannah talked about the lack of discipline and maybe the internal tensions inside the smp and the independence movement sturgeon had her strategy for years which was demanding indeed f2 from westminster and then they had this idea of a unilateral referendum and obviously the Supreme Court um, basically sunk that plan. To what extent do you think the SNP's problems are the fact that they just haven't got a credible plan B and that this is frustrating people in the independence movement because they don't know how they're going to get to their, their favoured 
constitutional destination. I, I think it's, yeah, it must be very frustrating. I mean, nobody really knows what the strategy is. Is it the most seats? Is it the majority of seats? D does it d does it winning the, the most seats lead to unilateral independence somehow? Or does it lead to talks beginning? Or does it lead to talks beginning on a referendum? No, no one really knows what it is. I, Alex Neil had some comments this week. And, and really, Alex Neil and, and you know some of the more realistic figures from the nationalist side and some of the more realistic figures from the, the unionist side have, have sort of put this that said, look, we, we need to put this on, you know, we need to put this aside. Alex Neil said what the SNP need to do is get support to around 55 percent, build a clear majority in the opinion polls, poll after poll after poll after poll, have it, you know, so that you can't argue that there isn't um, a, 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 a public opinion in favour of Scottish independence. And once you've got that, that's when you start talking about the mechanics of how do we do this, how do we get a referendum. The, the, the SNP are putting the cart before the horse because they, they want, you know, they, they want this general election to lead to a step towards independence, but there, there, there isn't any evidence to show that that's what most people in Scotland want. So, Hannah, they, they what do you think of the, the independent that, strategy just now and what Ben's been saying? Well, I mean, I think, was it today or yesterday, Hamza has given an interview, um, I think it was, was it Sky News, where he basically said if Keir Starmer becomes uh, <clears throat> the Prime Minister, he's going to demand a Section 50. Is that the... Yeah, section 30, I, isn't it? Yeah, Section 30, sorry. Um, I'm sure he said, that, and I just thought, this is just back to square one again. You're just back to, you know, and again, I think I've made this point before that, you know, you can say a majority, you can say most, whatever you want to say, that has no, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't actually equate to, you know, a... Uh, mandate for independence because you still have to get permission from you know the way that mechanism is just now as far as i can see the only way to get it is to get this section 30 order um and you know even under the tories or labor they're not going to grant that at the moment regardless of how many mps um the snp sends to westminster so yeah i just think that I think I agree with what Ben has said in terms of I think it was Alex Neil's points that you know they need to show consistently that the majority of the Scottish public are in favour of independence and it's not quite there, but it just feels as if based on Hamza's comments about if Keir Starmer takes over, um I just think they're they're running out of ideas. But then yeah, it's a huge sense of deja vu with it. I mean, I just, yeah. you know, the, the only way that you can get independence up to 55, 60% is if you govern effectively and you're seen to be pushing through policies that are actually benefiting people's lives. And if you look at every bit of the public realm just now, whether it's the NHS, schools, whatever, it, you know, the public sector is really struggling. Um, and related to which, maybe the, the second item we're going to discuss is these um, horror house building statistics that were published this week pretty much showing that house building is <coughs> down um, quite substantially across every single sector, whether it be private, social, housing association. I think housing association starts are at their lowest level since 1988, so the days of Thatcher. Um, ben, what's your response to these <coughs> statistics? Because you have a lot of young people who just can't get on the housing ladder you know, they're, they're in private lets getting ripped off by landlords. Um, you know, things that were opportunities were maybe available to you and I, they're not available to them anymore. They all look at these stats and think, what's going on here? Yes, well, um, my take on it is that it's it's kind of linked to some of the policies that the Scottish government have, have pushed through, in particular, Patrick Harvey and the Scottish Greens, who, who clearly have a, a huge influence in the Scottish government. Um, you know, we are now hitting some of these milestone dates where 
on the road to net zero, some fairly punishing new housing standards are being set. I mean, and, and, and it's it's directly linked to the, the the number of houses that are getting built. I mean, for years and years and years, we've been able to build houses with a gas boiler, um, with you know a, a decent standard of insulation, and, and all of a sudden, the, the goalposts have been moved. Um, I think it's uh, April. I mean, we're, we're coming up to April this year when when new builds. You know, the, the, you can't put gas boilers in some of them. Um, the, 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 the standards are so much higher than, than house builders are able to cope with. And the obvious, you know, this was always going to happen. The number of houses getting built reduces. Um, is it not more complicated than well, like, the policies of the SNP yeah, well, Green Government? I mean... Well, can I also say, though, like, house building is, is one issue, but being able to actually afford to buy a house is not just as simple as, oh, there's not enough houses available. Um, regardless of how affordable it might be, it's getting enough money to get a deposit together. Um, and, you know, I I think it's fair to say I'm a slightly younger generation than both of you and people of my generation, including me, um, I've had to wait until somebody in their family has died before they have any sort of money to put towards a deposit. I mean, you know, it's just, and, and I think that's actually got worse with the cost of living. The fact everything is going up, wages are not going up. People don't have the money anymore to put aside for a deposit. So, you know, if we're talking about people being able to afford to buy housing, it's almost like a perfect storm where people can't, afford a deposit they don't have the money for it but also as ben is saying about the the lack of houses actually being put up um that's my yeah two and, do you know what i think hannah as well you know it's a very complicated issue that relates to reserved and to devolved issues but we're in the position where you know the smp green government they're in power in edinburgh they're going to get the blame for it and that's just the way it is in politics and when you are cutting about two hundred million pounds from the affordable housing budget, like they are doing, mm. um, they're, they're seen as a government that is actually making this situation a lot worse. Yeah, I mean, I would say that ugh, you're right. They are going to get the blame for it anyway, and um, whether you know that's completely fair or not. But I do think that cutting that amount of money from the budget is is you know quite clearly not going to help. <clears throat> not going to help the problem um you know but then there's a bigger issue also of the fact that there's absolutely no money for anything and and you know um as we were talking about earlier the creative scotland situation you know they've do, withdrawing funding here there and everywhere you've got lots and lots of places that just don't have enough money to do basic things anymore um another another headache for hamza um just finally, a complete change of subject. Um, the Lib Dem MSP, Liam MacArthur, today introduced his assisted dying for terminally ill people in Scotland. Um, there have been a couple of attempts at this issue before. Slightly different uh, bits of legislation, but they both failed. They didn't even nearly get passed by MSPs. He says he's confident this time that MSPs will back the legislation. He thinks that there is compelling evidence to support the move. Ben, is Liam sort of maybe talking up his own chances a bit? Or, or do you genuinely think that this time, with this batch of MSPs, that assisted dying could be legalised? Do you know what? I, th I, think, I think it could be. I, I, I really think it's not so much that the, the batch of MSPs currently... Is is that different? It's more that I think society's maybe different than it was ten or even five years ago. The last time that, I'm not sure, fifteen or ten years ago, the last times that this was this was uh, considered. I, I do think that, that there has been a social shift. That there's Daily Express, um, mainly by my colleagues in London, has been running um, a, a, one of our trademark crusades on the issue. Uh, called Give Us Our Last Rights. I'm sure you've seen Esther Ranson and Prue Leith and other Express kind of uh, 
uh, favourites are, are, are back in this campaign. Esther, Dame Esther, uh, spoke to the Express today. She's she's all in favour of of Liam's uh, bill. That's um, a great slogan, by the way. The Express has got on that. It, give us our last. Yeah, it seems. Uh, I, I can't take any credit. As I say, it was it was done by the the UK edition, but but we're we're fully behind it. And and I do think this could be it. I mean, ironically, despite the fact that. I don't think much of the current Scottish government. Th- this bill could end up being one of the biggest things that happens in in devolution. You know, forget the smoking ban. If if assisted dying's passed before the end of the year, then you know that's clearly what what this administration, this parliament, will be remembered for. Um, obviously, it's a very very emotive subject. There are people will have strongly held personal views but i think you know lots of us have seen examples where you, you perhaps think god um it, it isn't there a better way that we can we, we can deal with people coming to the end of their lives on the other hand i, I guess sometimes people will say you know every, every day is a blessing and i don't know it's, it's a tough one but I, I i do wonder if this might be the this might be the the, the third time at times a charm, maybe that it goes through this time. Hannah, I mean, all three of the main party leaders uh, are against it. So Hamza and Ass, Douglas Ross, but it is a free vote of MSPs. Mm. What's your hunch? Do you think that Liam MacArthur and the supporters of the bills will, will, will get it over the line? Um, I don't know. I really don't know. I think that, you know, his view and I would probably agree, is that, you know, the public attitudes towards the issue have changed probably since the last time there was attempts to bring this through. Um, But if all three party leaders, main party leaders, are against it, even though you're saying there's a free vote, that always kind of, I feel like, you know, that's still going to hold some sort of sway with, MSPs. I, I don't agree. know. You know, like, uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm not too I, sure. I, I've but... got a feeling. I've got a feeling they might just fall short. I think it'll be really tight, but yeah, I think it will be close. But I do think definitely. I think I think more people and more members of the public are actually more are open to the idea. And I think that you know, regardless of what happens, I think it's good that we are actually having these conversations and. You know, unfortunately for, I suppose, people like us, it means that we're going to have to write some pretty grim, uh, some grim stories probably over the next kind of couple of months. But they're really important ones to tell. And I think that just opening the discussion about the issue is going to help um, people make up their minds, but also MSPs as well, who are maybe undecided on it. I think one of the the, the big things with, with the party question is that uh, um, as, as part of the Express Crusade we, th- there's now going to be a debate at Westminster um, and you know you might find that the that influences the, the way that I mean imagine if um, Keir Starmer were to come out and say Do you know what I think I'm in favour of this and then suddenly Anas finds himself at odds with the I think he uh, has. I think I think uh, Starmer has said he personally is has he? minded to right, it. Yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. So, so I mean, it is genuinely a free vote. I, I I do think on this kind of unique issue, you, you might find that a majority of MSPs vote against their party leader. Mm. Yeah, that's a that's a fascinating subject. Um, just bringing this to a close, Hannah. Starting with you, good week, bad week. Well. My bad week is for anyone who relies on ferries, um, so people in the islands, etc. Because we've had, you know, we're expecting yet another delay to these godforsaken Calmac ferries, and then we had Ferguson Marine, whose uh, chief executive got the boot uh, this week as well, and you know, once again, I feel like the Scottish government are really not taking much uh, responsibility for any of it. And then my good week is Michael Matheson because he, A, still has a job, miraculously, don't know how, but he does. And he has come back to Parliament 
uh, this week after being off for a period of time after the report came out, basically uh, saying that he's been a naughty boy. So welcome see, back. I, I saw Michael Matheson in the in the Parliament this week. He did have a bit of a spring in his step. He just seemed to be a bit more confident than, than he'd been. Well, would you not have a spring in your step if you were on an 80-odd grand a year job? And yeah, you'd, a, you know, It's a pretty good cushion. Un I'll, I'll give you that. Um, yeah, unsackable. Yeah. No, no, you're right. So, um, ben, how about you? Good week, bad week? Uh, good week. Just going back to um, the subject we were talking about there, it's been a, a good week for Liam MacArthur. Um, whether his bill uh, passes or falls, I think you know it's, it's a credit to him that he's he, he's put this together. He's, he's been so determined. Um, I mean, he's been working on it for years. I know he's, he's, he's been to the States. He's visited some of the states and some of the countries where assisted dying is um, it is legal. He's, he's spoken to a lot of families who are um, affected. And, and as Hannah rightly says, that they're not difficult. Sorry, they're not easy stories to, to write. So for Liam to have met so many of these campaigners, it, it, I think it's a, a credit to him. Um, so I think he's had a good week, no matter what happens. Mm. Uh, bad week. Um, again, sort of picking up from the, Hannah's bad week, really. It's been a bad week for uh, Mary McCallan, um, the uh, well-being economy uh, secretary, seems to be the one who's carrying the can for Ferguson Marine and the ferries fiasco. I'm not sure what the transport secretary is doing in all this, but uh, she, she uh, wasn't able to really answer questions yesterday as to why David Tideman had actually been sacked. Um, there was the extraordinary scene on Tuesday where an SNP backbencher, Stuart McMillan from Inverclyde, tried to uh, schedule a, a, an emergency debate on this and the, the SNP were whipped to vote it down. Um, but Mary McCann, was apparently otherwise engaged when Good Morning Scotland, who uh, you know normally can get hold of any ministers that they want, uh, wanted to discuss the issue. So it's not been a particularly good week for this rising star of the Nats. All right, that's great. Thank you very much. Comrades, um, there's not going to be any Planet Holyrood over the next couple of weeks due to recess, which is probably the famous, probably the, the, the favourite word amongst journalists and MSPs in the Scottish Parliament. Um, it's a, a delight. Um, so we'll be back in a couple of weeks and I hope you join us then. It's important we look at the facts. Why? Why? Douglas Ross is sounding pretty scared. I believe in independence. And he clapped like a seal.